Good evening. At this time, if you would, please silence your cell phones and be advised that these proceedings are being recorded. If you desire to address the City Council during the meeting, please complete, complete a request to speak form. They are available at the front entrance. And if you would, please give those to our City Clerk. Speakers will be called upon at the appropriate time. And our speakers will be allowed three minutes of speaking time. This time I will call to order and convene the regular meeting of the City of City of Grand Terrace City Council meeting for Tuesday, October 22nd, 2019. Our invocation tonight and our Pledge of Allegiance will be offered and led by members of Scout Troop 40. If you would please rise. Oh, Heavenly Lord, please bless us on this night. Uh, keep everybody safe and have a nice meeting to where we can discuss any flaws or good things within the city. Uh, we, 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 think, we thank thee, O oh Lord, for making everybody safe. Amen. Amen. If you would, please help me welcome the young men of Troop 40. They did that at the last minute at my request. <laughs> Madam City Clerk, may we have roll call, please. Council Member Allen. Present. Council Member Hussey. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. I am here. Mayor McNabo. Present. Council Member Robles is absent. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. We have a special presentation tonight. It is a proclamation for the 25th anniversary of the California Desert Protection Act. So I will read the proclamation and I believe Mr. Moises Cisneros is here tonight. So I'll read the proclamation. Um, we'll have a photo op and then I'll have you say a few words about this. All right. Commemorating the 25th anniversary of the California Desert Protection Act, whereas October 31st, 2019 marks 25 years since the beginning, or since the signing of the 1994 California Desert Protection Act, CDPA, which recognized the world-class uniqueness of the California deserts and provided destination points by creating the Mojave National Preserve, Joshua Tree National Park, and Death Valley National Park as well as 69 new desert wilderness areas in the California desert region. And whereas over the last 25 years, the protected lands and wildlife values of the California desert have created a benefit to desert travel, including visitor spending, industry earnings, and government revenue. And whereas the protected lands of the California desert are the historic home and contain the sacred sites, cultural artifacts, and cultural landscapes of the Chemhuevi, Mojave, Serrano, Cahuilla, and Paiute, and other tribes that have lived in the desert region for millennia. And whereas the protected lands of the California desert provide a place for members of the desert community and visitors alike to view wildlife, hike, bike, and engage in off-road motorized recreation. And whereas the protected lands of the California desert provides a place for residents who enjoy the rural character of deserts, mountains, and wild, line, wild lands to experience solitude, undisturbed vistas, 
and glorious sunsets and to gaze up in the night sky without light or noise pollution. And whereas the protected lands and conservation measures of the California desert safeguard precious groundwater, aquifer watersheds, desert plants and wildlife, and air quality critical to our region and economy, and whereas the protected lands and conservation measures of the California desert are the product of community input and stakeholder engagement, and whereas it remains in the city of Grand Terrace's interest to maintain the protected lands of the California desert as a recreational resource as part of the larger ecosystem and as wildlands, and now therefore be it resolved, the city of Grand Terrace honors and rec recommits itself to the safeguards within the past 25 years of desert protection and the scenic vistas, cultural landscapes, wildlife habitat, habitat, dark night skies, water resources, military security, and economic benefits provided by the protection of lands in the California desert presented this 22nd day of October 2019. It is signed by myself and my colleagues up here with me and uh, Council Member Robles, who could not be here tonight. If you would please join us over here for a photo. Thank you, Honorable Mayor McNabo and council members. On behalf of the Sierra Club and the Sierra Club members that reside here in the great city of Grand Terrace, we are heartfelt um, when hearing these uh, words from our mayor describing what uh, an important piece of landscape we have in our own backyard. The economy, the impact on the economy of the desert is in the billions. Uh, seven, billions uh, seven billion is used uh, to generate uh, a, a great uh, standard of living for those of us in the surrounding area that use this uh, desert not only as a sacred place but also as a, a, a part of our out, outdoor economy. Uh, I grew up in the concrete jungle I uh, didn't visit the desert for years, not until I was in my early 30s. I took my nephew with me. He was around 10. He grew up with asthma. Um, when we were out in the desert, we were out there for a week. Didn't even notice. I mean, we were jumping boulders, and it just it, it wasn't an issue. Um, he was breathing perfectly fine, and it was just a magical moment under the canopy of the Milky Way looked over at him and we just talked about his dreams and it was, it was beautiful to be in that awesome environment. So we just thank you and all those citizens here that are uh, protecting it and will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you for your work on this project. Okay, our next item is reordering of, or additions to a removal of items from the agenda and Madam City Clerk, we have items for removal. Staff is going to pull Council Member Robles' future agenda item request due to her absence from this meeting. Okay, thank you. So we'll move to the consent calendar. Cons consent calendar items are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They will be acted upon by the City Council at one time without discussion. Any Council Member, staff member, or citizen may request removal of an item from the consent calendar for discussion. Are there any requests for removal of items from the consent calendar? All right, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion for the consent. Mayor, I'll move that we, uh, what do we do with this thing? Uh, we approve the consent calendar. Second. Motion by Council Member Allen, second by Council, or Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. Please vote. 
Motion passes with Council Members Allen and Hussey voting yes, Mayor Pro Tem Wilson voting yes, and Mayor McNabo voting yes. All right, thank you. Next, we have public comment. And this is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on items not appearing on our regular agenda tonight. Because of restrictions contained in California law, the City Council may not discuss or act on an item that is not on the agenda. Um, they may briefly respond to statements or ask a question for clarification, and they may ask for a brief response from staff or that an item agen be agendized for a future meeting. Do we have requests to speak at this time? No, Madam Mayor. All right. We're saving it up for the items on the agenda. So we'll move on to Council co Communications, beginning with Council Member Jeff Allen. Thank you, Mayor. The first thing I want to do is, I, I didn't know if I could, if I should pull this item from the consent calendar. I didn't, I, I, I should have asked first, but I just wanted to, item six on the consent calendar was the letter of resignation from Ms. Suarez, Parks and Recreation Committee, who moved away. And I just wanted to publicly state thank you to Ms. Suarez for her dedication on the Parks and Recs Committee and, um, and to all the folks from the community who dedicate themselves to the various you know, committees and councils and boards and different things that helps our, our town move forward. We thank her for her time and wish her well. I do. Um, and so with that said, on October 9, I attended the Solid Waste Advisory Task Board uh, semi-annual uh, meeting. What I took away from that, I need to, or I'd like to bring it to your attention, that next year, uh, landfill organic waste must be, have a 50% reduction. That means all the food waste that goes to California's landfills. By 2020, there must be a 50% reduction. And in 2022, the regulations take effect and cities and counties have to start reporting this immediately. Uh, local governments will be responsible for almost all aspects of this um, effort by the state to uh, reduce our landfill waste by providing organic collection services to all residents and businesses, conducting education outreach in, in the community, um, secure access to recycling capacities, establishing edible food recovery programs. This is, gonna, this is what's happening net by next year is edible food recovery programs. And I think that's really a great thing because a lot of our uh, air quality is affected by the methane produced by the organic waste in our landfills. Um, so our cities, we, are gonna be, have uh, big responsibilities on us. We learned from a private recycler who is trying to establish a pulping plant and a mixed plastics to fuel plant, we heard from him. And uh, also that uh, we um, just, they talked about how over on California Street in Redlands, folks might want to try to avoid that. They're doing a lot of construction and grinding that street up. And uh, East Valley Recycling and Transfer has submitted a revision to the local enforcement agency to increase tonnage from 900 tons per day to 1,500 tons per day. On October 11, at the Omnitrans uh, route revision update meeting I attended, and I learned about that. And the only thing I want to say about that is I'll defer anything to you, Mayor, because you're on the board uh, of directors. But I just want to say that I and we are pushing strongly to get more bus stops, especially to go from here to the VA hospital, either from Riverside, from RTA, or from Omni Trans. We're really working on that. And so we want you to know that. I attended on, the, on October 17 and 18, I went to the League of California Cities annual conference and expo, and I learned about new technology there that's being used to optimize city outcomes and, and transportation and modern policing technology in California. Uh, resiliency and tragedies, and that's affecting a lot of communities today. Uh, it happened in Santa Rosa this morning. I just want to, uh, our thoughts go out to them. Um, we learned about you know, managing, uh, let's see, um, res yeah, resiliency, uh, preserving community identity and uh, m 
Cannabis for All and Managing Housing. No, wait, it's Managing Housing and Cannabis for All, or the, it's one of those. It was Housing for All and Managing Cannabis Use. That's what it was. Two different, two different training sessions. I was confused, but I learned about that too. And it was a great event, and I'm glad I went. Learned a lot. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Allen. Council Member Bill Hussey. Thank you, Mayor. I was going to say, Mr. Allen, I didn't know the Cannabis for All was part of the class. Must have been. I know it was a long session, but yeah, it was uh, really, okay, really unique to League of Cities and what they had. Um, I just got one uh, personal thing here is from the PTA for Grand Terrace Elementary or Terrace View Elementary School. Um, tomorrow is Unity Day. From, it's uh, from 7 a.m. or 7.10 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. What this is is a request from the PTA was, uh, I read it, please join us as we take the morning to greet our students as they arrive to school. Unity Day is the signature event, National Bully Prevention Month, has been recognized in the United States since 2011 to participate in Unity Day. Individuals, schools, communities, and business wear or display orange to show support for students who have been bullied. The message from us is to kindness matters. Let's spread kindness on this morning at Terrace View Elementary School and show the students we care about the safe and kind community. Please arrive at 7.10 a.m. and come in the front of the school. You're welcome to make your own personal posters with the message that are positive and uplifting. For example, we are glad to see you. Kindness matters, and it starts with you. I'm glad you're here. You are loved. Stand up for what's right. Smile. Life is good. Walk tall and spread kindness. You can wear orange or add orange to your uniform or attire. You're welcome to bring orange props to greet students. The more orange, the better. It's a simple message, and it's nothing more powerful than having all of you help send this message to our students. So thank you for choosing to participate in Unity Day. So it's open to anybody who would like to come out there at Terrace View Elementary and welcome the students as they come in in the morning. Um, wear orange if you have it, but just you know, be a kind smile out there and welcome them, and it's a uh, help uh, stop bullying in the schools. So that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Hussey. Mayor Pro Tem Doug Wilson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to uh, also mention that I, too, was invited and uh, I was the vot voting delegate for the League of uh, Cities uh, this weekend. It was actually the 16th, 17th, and 18th. And I, I remember now why I hate the 91 freeway because that's how I got back and it took me about three hours to get home. But other than that, when I was there, uh, there was a lot of educational opportunities as well as uh, league business. And uh, one of the items that we voted for was, uh, had to do with uh, uh, what they call Rule 20, which is a uh, utility fee. And it is, has, been, has been stretched, at least according to the vote, we're in the process of lobbying for it. Uh, to include wildfire uh, items because, as we know, there's a real problem with it. And as we saw here recently up in San Bernardino, uh, <clears throat> it can happen to anybody. Uh, I really also enjoyed a lot uh, the information about uh, a grant that is out there, and I've had some conversation with staff a little bit about it. Uh, but regardless of the grant, the important thing is, is that in order for us to be able to consider uh, providing for the future generations in additional housing opportunities, uh, as you know, we're a very uh, uh, non-dense area, and we like it like that. That's fine. Uh, but there are also opportunities when you've got, like I have, I've got a big old half acre, which most of it's useless, but I have a half acre behind me, and uh, instead I chose to build, I, I chose to take down my third car garage and put in place uh, and add to it a father-in-law suite. And that served my father-in-law for the eight years he was with us until he was 90 years old. And it worked out real well because it was an easy transition for him to sell his single family home in West Covina and then be there near us with privacy. Uh, there was no door directly between my house and, and, their, and his little uh, 
space. And it was equipped with a bedroom, a bathroom and a full bath, a full kitchen, and a uh, little nook area, and, and of course its own front door, and a little living area. In that, it was less than, or was, actually it was measured exactly 350 square feet, which is less than a two-car garage. And he was a big fellow, so it worked out really well for him. He could get around and do what he needed to do. So I would suggest that if you're contemplating that kind of circumstance, last year the state uh, passed some laws that made it desirable, and not only uh, desirable but also affordable. Uh, just remember that you need to hook your uh, addition onto the existing unit uh, in order to be able to avoid uh, impact fees and so on. So I would suggest that you contact the city if it's something that you find would work out for your plans and uh, see what you can put together in order to be able to create the, that second unit, uh, accessory unit. And that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. On October 10th, I attended the Metro Valley Study Session for the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority and there were a few items of business to report on that. One of them was the preview of hearings to consider resolutions of necessity for property interests for the Mount Vernon Viaduct project in the city of San Bernardino. And so that's a bridge that, that spans a number of railroad tracks. It's been in existence for decades and it, it really needs to be replaced. And so unfortunately that means that there's property that needs to be considered. So while they're negotiating that, um, they are actually looking at starting the process for condemnation at this time in the event that perhaps they don't reach negotiations with the owners of those properties. We also recommended for approval to the board a cooperative agreement with, the, with the Caltrans for plan specifications and estimates right away phases for Interstate 15 Corridor Contract 1 defining roles, responsibilities, and funding for these phases, and this is an expansion of Interstate 15 to include HOV and perhaps express lanes. And then we also recommended approval to the board for a second amendment to a contract with the City of Montclair for their construction of the Monta Vista Avenue grade separation project. On October 9th and 10th, I, w I attended the California Joint Powers Insurance Authority Risk Management Conference. They had some very interesting topics. One of them had to do with public liability after a fire and how to prepare for, uh, how to prepare your community for the things that come after a fire uh, perhaps comes through. We also had a nice, um, a nice briefing by a couple of cities that had to respond to major disasters in their communities, mostly due to wildfires. And their emphasis was on, on telling cities about how to set up your emergency operations centers and making sure that, that staff know what their role is in the event of any kind of a disaster. And probably most importantly, making sure council knows what its role is during these times as well. We, there was a, a session that I attended on cyber and ransomware exposure, and that's something that we really need to keep in mind because it can become very expensive and make it very difficult for the city to operate. Uh, there was a, also a discussion about approaches for staff who may encounter homeless and a nice way to approach those in the community that are homeless and help them to get to the help they need while staying safe. As Council Member Allen briefly mentioned, uh, there was a meeting with some Omnitrans staff Omnitrans is in the, in the process of identifying 11% cuts throughout their service area. And so they came and they, they briefed us on what they are proposing for cuts in Grand Terrace. We're not served by too many routes in, on Omnitrans bus line, but what we discussed with them is that uh, Riverside Transit Authority has a bus that comes from Riverside, drives all the way through our city out to Loma Linda and doesn't stop. They used to stop, and they used to stop and pick up passengers that wanted to head out to, to the Veterans Hospital or bring those at the Veterans Hospital back this way. 
And a number of years ago, they changed their route and they come through what they call closed door. So we had a discussion with Omnitrans staff about perhaps approaching Riverside Transit Authority to reconsider and, and maybe some um, memorandums of understanding that could be between the two agencies that might entice them to do that. So while they might cut a portion of our service, perhaps we might uh, persuade RTA to start serving us how they used to serve us. We'll see how that goes. On October 14th through the 16th, I had the opportunity to travel with about 36 other community leaders to visit the state water project at Northern California. They call it a Delta, a Bay Delta inspection trip. It started with a quick tour of Oroville Dam. We looked at a lot of the, the um, restructuring they've done since the, uh, since the spillway problems that they had in 2017. So the Oroville Dam, it's on the Feather River above the city of Oroville in Butte County, and it creates Lake Oroville, which does a number of things. One of them is it generates electricity, and it provides drinking and irrigation for the Central Valley, and it's very important for us in Southern California. When it was constructed, it cut off several miles of spawning and nursery grounds for salmon and steelhead trout, and so the salmon and steelhead trout generally return to their home at the end of their season to, to lay eggs. And so the, when they built this Oroville Dam, it cut off that passage for these fish. So co-located next to the, the Oroville Dam is a fish, fish hatchery that allows the fish to spawn and lay their eggs and give birth to many other fish that then populate that area. The tour, um, also included a proposed off-stream reservoir that's located northwest of Sacramento that would provide about 470,000 to 640,000 acre feet of water storage. This would improve water supply reliability and flexibility in the system for Southern California. Its investors are the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District and the Metropolitan Water District and other water districts. We also had a tour through the Delta Cross Channel and other areas in the Delta region. We were shown the issues that they are having that create the vulnerabilities in that inherent system that put in jeopardy the water that we receive from the State Water Project. And we learned of some of the research that they're doing. And lastly, we looked at the Banks Pumping Plant. This is located at the South Delta. It's called the Harvey O. Banks Pumping Plant. And it is the beginning of the California aqueduct. There are 11 pumps that lift water from the Clifton Court Forbay, lifts it 244 feet into the 444-mile aqueduct, and the water begins its journey from there, and it ends here in Southern California. So the water from this system provides irrigation not only to the San Joaquin Valley, but also to urban Southern California. It was an amazing tour, and it really shows the investments that have been made over the course of time in providing water for our region, but also the, the things that jeopardize the future of the ability for us to get water from the State Water Project, and to know that our San Bernardino Valley Water District is being forward-looking in its investments and its discussions about ways to improve the Delta. And that will conclude my report. So we'll move into the rest of our agenda on public hearings. We do not have any public hearings tonight. However, we have unfinished business. Item seven on the agenda, it's a proposed ordinance to amend Title 17 subdivisions and Title 18 zoning of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code to establish new minimum public hearing notification requirements on certain development related projects. As this is a second reading of the ordinance, um, the first reading was brought to council at the last meeting on October 8th. Staff has no changes to their presentation this time, correct? All right, so if there are no questions of staff, and there are no requests to speak on this item. That is correct, Mayor. All right, I will ask the city attorney to read the ordinance. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The title of the ordinance is as follows. An ordinance of the city council of the city of Grand Terrace, California, finding the ordinance exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and amending Title 17 subdivisions and Title 18 zoning of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code 
to establish minimum public hearing notification requirements on certain development-related projects. Right, and so we need a motion for this. Mayor, I move that we adopt the ordinance. Second. Motion by Councilmember Allen, second by Councilmember Hussey. Please vote. Motion passes with Council Members Allen and Hussey voting yes, Mayor Pro Tem Wilson voting yes, and Mayor McNabo voting yes. All right, thank you. Our next item is item eight on the agenda. It's consideration of three concept plans for development of 22317, 22293, and 22273 Barton Road, pursuant to the executed agreement for purchase and sale of real property and joint escrow instructions between the city of Grand Terrace and the Greens Group. And our city attorney has a brief statement he would like to make prior to Director Molina's presentation. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, before the director provides her presentation, I wanted to address three issues uh, for the city council. Uh, first is, what is before the city council tonight? Second, what is not before the city council tonight? And then third, what are the next steps in the process? So first, what is before the city council? Uh, and this is really for the public. Generally, when a, a seller of property sells their property, they wash their hands clean of it, and they're done, they move on. In this case, in the best interest of the city, the city council, when it sold the three properties, retained the right to approve the uses and the, and the, the types of uses and the combination of uses that could be developed on the property. To accomplish that approval process, the developer, uh, in accordance with the purchase and sale agreement, is required to prepare and present concept plans of the proposed uses and the various combinations and the site plans as a concept to the city council, and the city council has the authority to approve that. That is solely what is before the city council tonight, is the broad uses that are being presented for development on the property. But what is not before the city council? What is not before the city council is what I consider the general planning and zoning concepts that would normally be seen in front of the planning commission. So for example, the number of buildings, the sizes of buildings in terms of square footages, the heights of buildings, physical design of the buildings, landscaping, parking, circulation, all those details of an actual project are not before you tonight. And why? Because we haven't even determined what the uses on site will be. And so that has to first occur. Uh, once that occurs, and that's the next step in, uh, in my presentation is, the next step is once the developer knows exactly what uses are acceptable to the council and a, and a general conceptual site plan, the developer will put pen to paper, put a, a, an actual project proposal uh, for consideration by the city. They'll submit an application to the planning department, and once approved, once the, the application is deemed complete, staff will go through the pro process like it normally does for any other project, which is to review the project in comparison to our zoning code and our development standards, height, setbacks, things of that sort. The uh, staff will also do what is required under state law, which is to review the environmental impacts under CEQA. All that will then occur, and then, if necessary, and which I understand it probably will be, the project will be presented to the Planning Commission. And at that time, uh, staff will prepare a report. That port report will be made available to the public. There will be a public hearing involved, and the public will be invited to provide input and, uh, and participate in that process. My understanding is uh, that there will likely be elements that will require City Council approval. And so that project will then be brought to the City Council for approval. So I just want to make that clear tonight of tonight we're just approving or looking at the broad bird's eye view of what can be placed on site. After that, the developer will take it from there and uh, will be acting as a regulatory uh, agency thereafter. All right. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Director Sander Molina, Planning and Development Services. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. As indicated by City Attorney Guerra, this is... Um, Consideration by the City Council of three concept plans that are submitted by the, the buyer, Greens Group. Um, the staff is being asked, excuse me, City Council is being asked to consider and 
uh, recommend approval or approve all three concepts. Uh, prior to the uh, staff's presentation, there is a video that we would like to play. So this is, um, excuse me. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of Council. Um, this, this discussion that we're having tonight is consistent with our um, 2030 vision statement and also the priority list that the Council um, approved for this fiscal year. A um, little bit more background. The City Council approved on August 13th a purchase and sale agreement with Greens Group. And pursuant to that, to that agreement, escrow did open on August 16th. So right now the buyer is going through their due diligence period, and part of the uh, purchase and sale agreement required the submittal of the concept plan. Um, in that purchase and sale agreement, there was section, there is section 8.1 that uh, requires the concept plan and also identifies that the seller is in favor of certain uses, such as the office, hotel, sit-down restaurants, retail uses, the multifamily uses, um, the agreement also indicated that um, the seller did not want um, pawn shops, laundromats, um, service stations, gas stations, and convenience stores. And so um, those were the parameters by which the agreement was approved. The um, properties are, are um, just west of the canal. This is uh, Brickdale assisted care facility. McDonald's is here on the west, and so it's these three parcels that um, are the subject of discussion and, and escrow at this particular time. The three concept plans um, are proposed, and the, as indicated by the city attorney, the council is only considering the uses, um, and what this does is once the council or the seller um, indicates the uses that are acceptable to seller, then that um, and, and by proposing, the staff proposing all three different concepts, that gives the buyer the, the flexibility to be able to move forward with any of those concepts and expedite the process. 
Um, the next step, again, is to go through the entitlement process through the city uh, planning department, and it'll go through public hearings to the planning commission. So um, the agreement required a site plan to show the arrangement of the structures, and to show the improvements that would be constructed, to show the parcelization. Um, we anticipate that the site will be resubdivided. Um, the buyer is also aware that with the development of the site, intersection improvements will be, need to be done on canal. And so um, in doing that, this property here, this corner, is owned by Brookdale. We refer to it as Brookdale property. And when this intersection's improved, there will need to be some right of way acquired and um, widening done to accommodate through access. The city um, city manager has spoken with, with Brookdale property owners and they are aware of this request and they are open to um, the uh, process of allowing the improvements and then also possibly acquiring in the future the property. So concept one, which is in the staff report, um, this provides the schematic and it shows the office, hotel, multifamily, residential, multifamilies here on the south side adjacent to Brookdale and the residential properties. Um, this shows the incorporation of the Brookdale property, which although it's not acquired, it's provided and it shows a complete street escape and also how it's integrated. It's uh, proposed or shown here as a possible park or open plaza. And these, um, these uses are consistent with the purchase and sell agreement. Um, but because this Brookdale property is not owned by the buyer, it's not controlled by um, the buyer, the second concept plan is uh, the concept that excludes this park area. And this is the same uh, type of uses, the same layout. Um, Brookdale property should it be acquired. It can be easily integrated, integrated to, to um, be consistent with concept plan one or integrate it in some other fashion. Concept uh, plan three, this is, uh, this is where it's a little bit different. Um, concept three is being proposed by the buyer because there is a demand for a uh, convenience store and fueling station. And so the buyer has provided this concept that shows those uses. And again, it's proposed because there's an interest, there's, um, by allowing this type of use, there's, a, there's an end user that um, would move forward with this, and this would kickstart the project and uh, see it to completion. This, this proposal um, still has the office, the hotel, and the multifamily on the south side. Um, it has one drive-through, uh, sit-down restaurant, and then again, in this um, corner here, this northeast corner, it shows the convenience store and fueling stations. Um, there's just two, two things to keep in mind with this proposal, this proposed concept. One is that um, the purchase and sell agreement did indicate that the city did not favor these type of uses. The purchase and sell agreement wasn't um, so clear, or I should say it wasn't so specific to say that the uses were prohibited, and so it does allow the seller to consider it. Um, it's just not the seller's first choice of uses. The other thing too is that in the future should Brookdale property become acquired um, by the buyer, it's, it's um, we would wanna see how this property would integrate with the, with the, with the rest of the center. Um, when you have, excuse me, when you have these um, restaurant uses that lend itself to this open area that can then be utilized by the users of these restaurants uh, with the convenience store, um, buyer would need to show us how that would integrate because it just seems to be a little bit different as far as the, um, integration, of the integration of the uses, but we would, we would want to see that. Um, so those are the concept plans. Now there was the video that was shown earlier, but these are just a few pictures that or photographs we wanted to um, show the council and the audience. These are actually renderings of the entire site. And then this is the retail component, hotel, the residential in the office. And so um, staff is recommending that the city council approve all three concepts and allow the buyer to move forward with the concept that works best to get the project going um, and see it forward towards completion. And also um, 
the council also, the seller has the option to provide some other direction if it, sees, it seems that that would be appropriate. And then finally, if um, the city council or the seller does recommend or does approve all three concepts, then we would direct the city manager to issue a written approval to Greens, which then gives them the green light to, to move forward. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Director Molina. Are there questions of staff at this time? Councilmember Allen. <clears throat> how is it that the items that are shown in concept plan three, how do they expedite or kickstart the project? And is there anything else that could expedite or kickstart? Why or why not? Thank you. So, um, Councilmember Allen, I think that that question is best answered by the the, um, the Greens group because they've been in, you know, they have that background information and can better demonstrate that or explain that. But I'll, I'll be happy to, to um, respond to any other questions you may have. Um, that's the only one I have right now. Uh, and if you don't want to answer it, that's fine. I can take it later. Okay. You, you don't, you, you don't. It's, what did it, in it's high okay level, high, high level, what it is is that there's there's a there's a, an interest for that type of use. Okay. And if that interest moves forward, then there's a financial component that helps construct the project and do all the infrastructure improvements. And I think the city manager, Mr. Duffy, wanted to to also add to that. Mr. Duffy. Yes, thank you, Mayor. For the record, G. Harold Duffy, City Manager. And uh, the uh, applicant, the Greens Group, can actually answer this question. But often in development projects, what, what the developer will have to do is they will, they, will, they will shop the project. And then based upon interest uh, for the project, they can then monetize that interest. And so because they've already received significant interest in a certain type of category, they're looking at this and they're saying, OK, so, so we can spend uh, our uh, appropriate time marketing the project, or we, if we have someone already to give us the financing to be able to push the project forward, it just cuts down time. And that's that's what she's saying is that the, is the, the interest is there based upon the market, and this is all about the market and uh, being able to monetize your contracts to to, to your complete building. But uh, if you, Greens Group, Adam Cor Adam Corral and Angelo and Angel uh, Orozco are here from the Greens Group and. More than welcome to add anything if you want to, sir. Honorable Mayor, <clears throat> City Council staff, um, thank you for having us today. So well, the whole concept here is we're working on a project over at Van Beer and, and the 215 freeway right now, and it's a very similar mixed-use development. And what we found is it, when you have a large project, a lot of people always sit there and say, especially when you're taking it to the market with brokers, what happens is, Somebody will ask the question, well, who's coming? Who's coming? Who's coming? And we had a hard time. We bought that property out in 2014, and lo and behold, we got lucky and in and out came. So once in and out came, we secured Starbucks. We were able to secure um, uh, Jersey Mike's. We got uh, another fuel station out there, uh, 76 Circle K, and uh, Hampton Inn. Um, so, but, but it took that initial user to take that, that first step. Right now, we actually have a user that's interested in that first step and that's actually the fuel station. So that's what it allows, is it's like who's coming and you can sit there and say somebody, and the fuel station actually does drive traffic that will also help a coffee shop or some type of other user to come in online. So that, that's why we're actually asking council and um, staff to consider this project. Thank you, Council Member Allen. Um, yeah, I just had one more is, so how, how much do you believe it would expedite? What's the quantitative value of that, of that is it? It's six months, a year, six weeks? It, it's all market driven and honestly it's, it's really hard to say. It just really depends on what the brokers can, can secure. Um, the, the other thing I like to point out too is, is with that type of density, one other thing we've learned in our, pro, in our mixed use development projects, it's exactly like what mm -hmm. uh, uh, the city attorney just stated a little while ago. It's also better I think to analyze a project with that type of density so because it's always better to have density and not need it than to need it and not have it. So we, we would like to actually analyze it to the maximum extent practicable on the site. It was, it was interesting to, that I noted that the project you're doing, you mentioned in, on Van Buren 215, that the, um, the, the entity that kick-started that project was a restaurant. Is that correct? correct? 
Correct. Yeah. But, that's, but what, it, that's a, yeah, okay. Uh, totally understandable, yeah. sir. Um, in this case, we actually have a user actively interested in pursuing the site. So th that's the one thing. If you don't have a user, then somebody comes in and says, well, who, who else do you have? And it's like one of those things that can actually become harder to market in the future. So that's why we'd like the city council and staff to um, consider this, this option. Thank you. Thank you. Before you sit down, sir. Before you sit down. And are you Mr. Orozco? I'm sorry? You're, you're oh, I'm sorry. My name is Adam Corral. I apologize. Adam I'm, Corral. I'm the VP of Del Development at Greens. Mr. Corral. Thank you. I, I don't know if you can answer at this time or if it's even appropriate to ask, but what, what's the potential val value of this project once it's built out? It really depends on the, on the actual mix of uses at the end of, of the game. Uh, it depends on who we secure for the office tenants. It's, it's actually, we're, we're pursuing it as creative office or even medical office. Um, it, there's a lot of variables in that, but uh, I couldn't tell you like what the actual, uh, at this stage of the game, what the actual value of the project would be at the end. Okay, so you're not, and you're not comfortable with a the ballpark then either. Oh, I, I don't, I'm not a number, I'm not no, the numbers no, guy on that side. Right. If Oppen were here, he'd probably That's be able okay. to divulge that information. But. That's okay, I appreciate that. All right, any other questions of staff or uh, Mr. Carell? All right, thank you so much, I appreciate that. All right, we'll open public comment at this time. We have no public comment, Madam Mayor. All right. We'll close oh, I, I do apologize. I, I, I'm so sorry. We have one email that we did receive. I believe you have one coming towards you here, too. We received an email from Ms. Stromwell, who um, opposes the project, and she would prefer something smaller, but she does not like any of the concepts as presented. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kenneth, Kenneth Sipes. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just a few comments. What does Grand Terrace need with four gas stations? <laughs> um, the convenience store that's proposed, is this convenience store going to drive the convenience store out of business that's been a long-term resident of Grand Terrace? Um, how many times has the Holiday Inn Express around the corner been filled to capacity that we would need a hotel here? Those are my comments. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sipes. I appreciate you being here, and I appreciate you speaking. Do we have another request to speak on this item? No right, matter. Please turn that in. Thank you. Ms. Linda Bartman. Yeah, um, just want in all this planning to take into consideration the, commu the, the housing tract right behind, which is where I live, Reed Avenue, it's got, um, we're right behind the um, senior complex and right across the street from us they built the hidden gate. Now you're going to take away what little view we have left of anything right there. Building, we're one house away from that field you're going to build in. And we've been there 33 years and we've seen a lot of changes and you took away our view of the mountain. Now you're going to take away our view of anything we're going to have what a three-story apartment complex right at the end of our street i don't think any of you on that board or on that council would want that right outside your house and i think you really ought to take that into consideration everybody in that little street we live on it's about a three block area have been there long term i'm surprised more of them are not here but um you know, consider everything. Consider the people that have been there long term. Been in Grand Terrace when it was still a little pokey nothing town, and that's why we moved here. And please don't block what little view we have left. Don't put an apartment complex right at the end of our street. Just, you know, think about the little people. 
Thank you, Ms. Bartman. I appreciate you being here and I appreciate your comments. And I see another request to speak for him. Ms. Cindy Bidney. Hi, guys, I'm back. <laughs> Um, I want to thank you for your support and your service. Um, I want to thank the mayor for supporting our neighborhood. I saw you out there walking the project with your husband and uh, considering our concerns. I'm sure you all remember a lot of the concerns that we had while Stater Brothers was uh, proposing their project. And who was the other guy, Johnson or somebody? Um, our neighborhood has suffered some problems with um, kids hanging out, drugs, uh, whatever's going on back there, uh, littering over there um, by the wall. And as you know, our neighborhood is very close to that wall. One of the things we fought for was to have a setback so that we wouldn't have to be so close to the project. One of the good things that happened was there was a driveway put between the, um, the Stater Brothers and our neighborhood. However, the project that, that's being proposed is like five stories high and right to, back to our, our neighborhood. One of the rights that we have is quiet enjoyment. I fought for that uh, when the Stater, uh, Stater Brothers project was going in and exactly what happened. We have deliveries at 5.30 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning. They wake me up. Um, it's consistent. The mayor's helped me out with that. I've had some, some delay, in, in, um, but it, it happens again and again. Um, Overbuilding that site is not conducive to our little neighborhood. What we really talked about, uh, what was it, 20 years ago was um, a river walk setting, something, um, something we as a neighborhood could enjoy. And I'm not going to enjoy people in a hotel looking down into my backyard. I'm not going to enjoy, I don't know what kind of multifamily, uh, I guess it could be anything. It could be retirement, it could be section five, it could be uh, apartments. And all of that makes a huge difference. I'm not against developing. I'm not. I never have been. Um, but I would like you to be responsible and take care of us. Um, and also take care of your promise to our neighborhood before the project was supposed to have a development of, of shrubbery and greenery on our side. And that's all gone to the wayside. OK, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Bidney. I appreciate you being here tonight. One more. Thank you. Jay Bartman. <coughs> Hello, my name is Jay Bartman. I live at 12220 Reed Avenue. And I've uh, been there 30, 33 years. And we have some concerns. We, uh, when the uh, Hidden Gate facility was put in across the street from us, we were told, oh yeah, there's going to be a wall so you can't see into their, into their homes, they can't see into yours. Um, well, those, those uh, lots were raised up so high, there's a wall there, but the wall doesn't keep us from looking into their house or their, them looking into ours. We had concerns about the, uh, the traffic lighting. You know, when they come down their street, they're going to shine their lights into our house. Uh, we were told they would put a, a solid barrier. They did not. They put the solid barrier on the Deberry side. So now we, we have their lights coming into our house. When the Stater Brothers facility was put in, we had concerns. We came here. We had concerns about the lighting, lighting up the area at night. Um, it's, it's pretty bright in our backyards. The, uh, this new facility is only gonna add to that. Uh, no matter w how it's addressed, you're gonna add people with lights 
it's going to be bright. Another concern is we don't want Reed Avenue going through. We don't want the traffic. We don't want foot traffic. Uh, if, if there's even a walkthrough gate, we will be inundated with shopping carts. We don't want that. Um, I, I am sorry to report that we have had trouble on our street with vandalism. My, our mailbox has been destroyed three times in this year. I reported it once to the police. Um, my neighbor, same story, and on down the street. You can, you can talk to the other residents and they've had the same problems. Um, I used to be on the skater side, not anymore. They throw trash in our house, you know, in the front yard, in the street. Um, it, I, I hope that you address these issues that we have. And we really don't want to see five-story buildings, four-story buildings, three-story buildings. You know, we, we, we really we just don't want to see that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bartman. I appreciate you being here tonight. Curtis Holt. Hi, good evening. Um, I live at 12209 Pascal, which is on the corner of Pascal and LaPay, right behind the State of Brothers as well. The area on Reed has been a problem. We have people parking back there, loot acts, drugs. We have a hard time uh, policing that and we have a hard time getting the police out there. So this is one thing that I think should be taken into consideration as well. With another multifamily housing project that's gonna be able to climb over the wall as people are doing now, I think this is going to increase. So I hope that you guys take into serious consideration uh, the police force that we have in this city and plan to make moves to give us a little more protection in that area. I, I just don't want to see it get any worse. I've only lived here five years, but I'm the one that's moving people off of La Pay, and I'm probably getting a reputation for that already, but um, we, we just don't need any more problems in that area. So please take all that into consideration. Thank you, Mr. Holt. I appreciate you being here tonight. All right, with that, I will close public comment. Okay, how many more do we have? You have one in your hand. All right. Tara Sestenia. Hi, my name is Tara Sestenia. I live at 22540 Brentwood Street uh, in Grand Terrace. I'm also a planning commissioner, so for full disclosure. Um, I understand everybody's complaints and issues, but I also understand Madam that- Madam Mayor, may we take a two minute break? Sure, we're in recess for two minutes. All right. <laughs> Um, I'm we sorry. Will, we I've, will reconvene our regular <laughs> meeting and Tara Sasenya. And I've been informed that my position as the planning commissioner omits my being able to make a private citizen comment. So I'm going to re retract my paper. Thank you. Because this will come before you later on. Yes. Thank <laughs> you for being here tonight. All Madam right. Mayor, Madam Mayor, if I may, just to clarify. Mr. The, City Attorney. Thank you. Um, so what I, I just advise is that she's welcome to speak as a member of the public, but if she does, potentially that may uh, uh, affect her ability to participate in the decision when it does go before the Planning Commission. So it's her decision, but I just wanted to make her aware of that right. issue. I appreciate the decision that you made. 
and, and just to be clear for the record, that, that applies whether she's in support of the project, against the project, whatever her thoughts are. Just want to make that clear. Okay, I know I rushed you in writing your name. Ag Angela Wagnon, thank you. I thought about that as I wrote it down. I went, nobody's gonna be able to read this. <laughs> um, we live at 22322 Van Buren Street. We lived, lived here 18 years. And um, I'm excited for, we need tax revenue. I do understand that. I don't think we need four gas stations and a convenient, we have a convenience store. We're not even four square miles. I mean, I know that there's the new subdivision that's over in High Grove. They probably could use it, but I mean, it's not really necessary. But my husband and I would love to have a restaurant where we can go and sit and have a drink and food at the same time. We don't have that. We have one sit down restaurant. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. Uh, so I like the first two, if you guys could possibly not do the gas station and the convenience store, that would be, that's all I wanted to put in. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. I appreciate you being here tonight. Okay, is that the last one? As far as I'm aware. All right, I'm gonna close public comment and bring it back to council for their comments and consideration of a motion. Uh, Madam Mayor. Council Member Allen. I, I have some comments that I have like to make about this project. Um, Um, I like the concept plans, um, the three of them that were presented. Um, I like this whole idea of this development, this mixed-use development. Um, if, I, if I had my preference, though, I like, the, I like the concept plan one with the outdoor area, that little you know, sliver of land that's right by the entrance road. Um, I think that's concept plan number one. Um, I th are there uh, council, any... Council Member Allen, I think the concept number two is similar to that, but it is taking into consideration that they may not have control of that piece of land there. Yeah, that's correct. I, I am, I'm aware of that, and I, that's why I prefer number one. And I'll tell you, the... The thing I envision with that piece of land right there, and the reason I like it so much is, um, uh, I really enjoy going over to Redlands to that, I think it's called Mountain Plaza near the Harkins Theater. And they have that outdoor area where the families can come together and there's several restaurants and they even have live performances on weekends, live bands come there. And I envision that sort of a venue, that sort of an idea, I mean, we have a specific plan, and in this plan, we said we want more pedestrian-friendly Barton Road, and I strongly believe that concept plan number one will help bring that vision to reality. And, um, you know, whenever our city was uh, founded in 1978, folks, when they selected a name, they didn't say, well, let's just call it Average Terrace. And nobody said, hey, um, nobody stood up and said, hey, let's just call this everyday ordinary just like all the other terraces, terrace. You know, that's not us. You know, we, our, our founding residents, those who started this, this beautiful city, they had a vision, and our city staff has worked hard towards that vision and the elected leaders. And um, they, they, had, uh, they knew that they had something extraordinary up here on this hill, on this terrace, and that's why they named it Grand Terrace. And so I'd like to challenge us to be bold in this development. I don't want to just see canal crossing. I'd like to see Grand Canal Crossing. Right? All right. So let's get busy and get to work. All right, thank you, Councilmember Allen. Further comments? Councilmember Hussey. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody who came out here and spoke. Um, you know, we all care about our community. We all moved here for a reason because it has that Mayberry town feel. And um, 
talk about mailboxes and crime, you know, it even affects my street. And I live off the beaten path, but my street's used as a throw-through and a lot of other council members. So we live here, we understand, you know. I end up building mailboxes for all my neighbors because they're getting vandalized and, you know, car windows smashed. So we are not immune from the crime. Crime's going to continue to happen. We had the sheriffs, and they're doing the best of their ability. You know, I like to have a sheriff at each block, but we can't. And then uh, we hear about development. Since I've been on the council, one of the things I always heard from business owners is this place isn't user-friendly, this city, for business. We can't get de any development going here. We can't do this. We can't do that. Um, I believe Irene heard that Lowe's was uh, approved at one time, and then it got you know, turned away from the city. So there's been a lot of what is, what's coming in. I don't even tell my wife what's coming in because until we do the ribbon cutting ceremony because people I've seen since I've been on the council back out all the time. And, um, but you know, we think about the residents and what they need and, and we're concerned about them. But then again, I gotta think about the residents, what they need and concern about them. And that's one of the things, um, being on the council, you, you don't realize the cost of everything. Our biggest cost is to have our law enforcement to maintain the, the safety of our city. And one of the things that we look at is development. The city manager, he's been given a marching orders to find his development so we can maintain the city cost and maintain the, the Mayberry atmosphere. Now, unfortunately, growth does happen. And sometimes, you know, it happens in our backyard and doesn't, you know, we might not like it. And... You know, the city council, we try to work things around, and I think it's a nice development. Do we need four gas stations? I don't know. I know one gas station I try to get in, it's like impossible sometimes to get in there. But we do need a development, and it's been a dirt lot for a long time, and what's come in, our city has grown. We're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of traffic from High Grove. They all shop here. We do have one sit-down restaurant that does serve... Uh, alcohol so just to put that in perspective but uh, I'm just saying you know we have to think about the concepts I liked all the concepts like Mr. Allen I do prefer concept one with the plaza and it's nice because I've been to that area and you can see you know it's nice family get together and that's what the city is about it's family and getting together and maintaining in our little areas so we can shop and be uh, united so we don't have to go outside other communities and shop we have heard about people that wanted to stay in hotels and stay in Grand Terrace because they feel safe. That the students that go to Loma Linda, their families that want to stay in Grand Terrace. We have things in our high school where they have the robotics competition and nobody had places to stay. The multiple family residential, you know, in the states um, has cities and they want to develop multiple family residential areas because we all know the property is expensive here. So we have to look at their needs too, the young families starting out. So, you know, approve all three concepts, but I really like concept one, but I'll leave that up to developers. So that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, you have comments? Thank you. <clears throat> I have a, uh, I'm requesting a clarification from staff. Uh, that, uh, I guess the exit or whatever it is, near the multifamily residential unit, is that not a, a, a fire exit only? <coughs> says the slight best I can tell with our little deal here it says it's sliding that doesn't tell me anything mayor pro Tim Wilson are you on the slide here are you referring down in this area yeah well to the left of it right there the, this this may be um, is that a fire exit? yes it's a fire exit that's what I thought so okay. it's only set up for emergency fire egress it's not set up for, you know, regular everyday traffic, correct? Okay. So just so the neighborhood knows that. All right. So the intention is not to, you know, you get a freebie in between the multifamily residential and your houses. Yeah, that is Mayor just Pro Tem, an emergency. I think, I think Director Molina has more to say on that. Just, just for clarity, um, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, so this, and, and yes, we're not talking about site development, but because question was asked, uh, this residential multifamily, the, the, the residents of this have access through the center and through this back end, but this commercial traffic has no access to the residential. 
There you go. And I think that's that's where you, where you were going with that. That's where I was going. Thank you. Okay. The further discussion of all of this will be at the Planning Commission if we decide to move forward with this. And so I hear questions from the audience, but we've, we've gone past the public comment period, and we're really just looking at the concepts and what we like here tonight. So Mayor Pro Tem, did you have more questions about the comments, or more comments about the concepts, which ones that you like in particular or do not like? No, it's just an issue that had been raised by one of the uh one of the neighbors, and I just thought it would be interest, interesting to understand what the intent, okay. the concept was. Okay, thank you. Mr. Adam Corral, you uh, had a comment that you wanted to make? We at Greens, we pride ourselves on finding the win-win for not just between the city and for the developer, but also with the members of the community. Um, I am happy to meet with anybody after this this hearing and just talk about the projects, talk about their concerns, and try to figure out how we can um, live harmoniously. Um, we were very conscientious about putting a residential development a adjacent to the residential development to create that buffer between the retail pieces and what, what the members of the community would be predominantly concerned about. Because I believe the RFP originally had it to where that was going to be a commercial use, but we were actually the ones saying that doesn't make sense because of the community. So that was one of the things that I wanted to kind of point out to everybody, that we are trying our best to try to accommodate the community as well as the city needs, along with having a successful development. And I also got an answer for you, the development would be about $50 million Thank you. net asset. Um, and the one other thing I'd like to add is, is, is we still would like to move forward with option three, only because, like I said, it's like I wanna, we want to analyze that density and everything else. So if we could also still consider that, I greatly appreciate it because, like I said, we are trying to create that buffer. And, you know, I think that everybody likes to have choice as far as, like, what they, where they want to fill up. All right. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crow. Further discussion from the council? Council Member Allen. Well, I don't, I don't think that the, uh, the question is, for me is not about whether or not Grand Terrace can support another gas station. Um, I just would like to, if we do, I would rather see it in a different location, closer down to, you know, somewhere between Michigan and the freeway, and, uh, or on the other side, you know, and not in that particular uh, development. So I believe that over time, as, as in, in the future, the traffic's gonna be there that can support you know, another fueling station. But I prefer in this development what I see in concept plan number one. Okay, so you're saying you would like to ha only, only consider concept one? Um, no, I'm not saying that I would only consider concept plan number one. Okay. But I'm saying that my, I strongly prefer concept plan number one. All right. It's my, my preference. I just see, a, I, I know we're trying to create a, an area that's pedestrian friendly, walkable, enjoyable in the evenings, and I just think that that plan can help us uh, achieve that vision. I think all of the concepts have been well thought out, at least for a concept. And I do like that, that our proposers have really taken to heart what we said and, and wanting to create a buffer between the residential and the commercial. I do like concept plan one the best. I understand con concept plan two is very similar, but you don't have control of the Brookdale property. Although if concept plan one and two were were considered, I would hope that there would still be the, the idea that when there's an opportunity to um, purchase and control that land, that, that that might be developed. But I think that that would add to the charm of the center. Um, having said that, concept three, I understand that it's not as desirable as the others. But if you have that use, and you're able to market it better, that does make it something for the, 
for the actual ability to create the whole center. And it does, it, it does make it important to be able to, to market it that way. So, I mean, I could see, I could see agreeing to all three and saying, you know, you're going to go through a lot to get to the, through the planning commission. You're going to go through a lot when you, when you speak to the residents and, and get their considerations. And I imagine that there's probably going to be some change by the time you get this finished. So I could support um, moving forward with all three concepts. Uh, Mayor. Councilmember Allen. I would like to know if there's any, if anybody could say with any sort of authority how, if concept plan number three were approved or were the one that was made, went through with, how, what effect does this, um, this business, the, this, this convenience store gas station have on those other businesses who are looking to occupy those pads? Is whoever's first, does that influence whoever comes afterwards? Is my question, you know what I'm saying? It's an interesting, Craig. Mr. Duffy, can you comment on that? Because I'd like to have some high, high quality grand businesses in this, <laughs> in this development, you know, some really, you know, good stuff. Yes, and if I understand the question, I, you're looking for, um, I mean, there are no guarantees in terms of, uh, in terms of the development. What, what I can tell you based on my experience and based on uh, my conversations with, with the Greens Group, the strategy in which they're using is to have that first user and then and bring in, after going, after going to several uh, conventions, shopping center conventions, it's, it's always important to have you know, that, that, that one carrot for the other developers. And it's, it's, you know, when we were at the conference the other day, uh, and we saw that happening tonight, um, is once you get the one person to step out there, and it's, it's the one business to say, this center is a good center, and if it's a national brand, then you have them follow. If you ever go to, uh, uh, if you ever go to a, a shopping center, if you go to uh, a, a Walmart, when I was doing development in other cities, I, would, I mean, people didn't like Walmarts, but I said, you have to look beyond that. When you go to Walmart, there's always feeder stores around, around them. So if you go to, right, right now, what I, what I see when I go to Corona, I see a Stater Brothers, an AutoZone, I see a Miguel's, and then I see what, what I'm hoping, I just, I just referenced what, what's happening here. Then I see Chipotle and, and Carl's Juniors and other places around those centers. And so what you, ha what you have here is that once you get a national brand, and whoever that national brand is, they've got a model that's, that says these customers <coughs> congregate in this particular area. And so depending on who the national brand is, you're going to, ha you're going to have that, that um, synergy uh, developed there. Yeah, but what kind of business would, I mean, does the first business in influence the rest of the businesses that come in? I mean, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, right. does... Well, I, I think it really, it, it's about, I, there, there are no guarantees, but it's really about relationships and it's about uh, the business model. Um, I can tell you, based on the tax revenue, every business type and what the value is going to be. That same model is run by the Greens Group. They have a relationship with, he just, he just told you uh, that his first, his first uh, deal in Riverside was in an out burger. Um, and so part of this whole process for me was this project I was marketing this project three years ago, going from shop to shop to shop to shop to shop. And then I got smart and said, wait a minute, the real thing is get a developer to do it because they've got the relationships. And so what you'll, what you'll see happen is that once you get the national chain in, then you'll get, you'll get the others to follow. Okay, so 
I'm, I'm thinking about the newest developments around us. I'm mm -hmm. going to think about the one in the Redlands, you know, like over there where the Sprouts is. I'm, there's not a gas station there. And I'm going to think about, there's a, um, an, let's see, no, there's not a gas station at that one. I don't, you yeah. know. Well, and, and so they have national yeah. brands. Well, and that's because, you know, in Redlands, they, they do have that density. And one of the things that people need to understand about Grand Terrace in terms of the development, people see Grand Terrace as 12,000 uh, 12, population uh, through three square miles. And, and so we have a, a retail capacity of about $65 million in a one mile radius. But that number jumps to 250 million when you go to a three mile radius. That number jumps to, at a five mile radius, that number jumps to $1.6 billion. And if you, if you look at around us, how many shoppers that we have right now in this general area that shop in the, the nearest biggest section of, of shopping centers is San Bernardino. And, and most of the residents in Grand Terrace, High Grove, Loma Linda will not cross the 210 freeway to go over there. So they're going much further away. And so we have a retail sales leakage that shows that we have this five mile, capa five mile capacity where Barton Road could be the center of commerce f for the area. And so by, by this center should be, a cav should, should be the catalyst to, to doing just that. So the first one in is going to, is going to make, is going to make a, a, really big, a really big impact. I think what Council Member Allen is saying is if the first one in is a gas station, does that mean that the rest that follow aren't as big a name as they might be if you started with something other than a gas station? Yeah, do we get a Nordstrom's or do we get a dollar store? Well, I think what you, what you really have, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question, but the Greens Group and any developer that is going to look at Grand Terras they're, they're looking at, the first thing is they're looking at the median household income. So people want to go to Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's will not come to Grand Terrace because Trader Joe's needs $100,000 median income. Although ours is good at $69,000, they, they will not come in, into, into the area unless you have a really dense population. And so um, the first, and I've talked to multiple developers, if the first one's fuel, what you're gonna have there is this. Fuel isn't the caveat, but the driving factors of, 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 of cars coming in is gonna, it's gonna increase. So fuel becomes the destination point, but then you have all these other amenities and, and, you, and, that's, what, and that's what happens. So you know, if you had a Trader Joe's come in, that would be great. Then you would get lots of other activity around it. You have a fuel station come in, and it's not because of the fuel; it's because of the traffic that's driving into the fuel station, and that's going to generate the the other restaurants and the and the fast food places and so on and so on. And so the developers can tell tell you more about this, but my ex my experience has been is that they've got a model that they've built in, and it's so very important to have a a successful developer who has a list of uh, clients that they've worked for, that, that they're gonna be able to build a good development, have a reputation, and they're gonna be able to offer a quality product. And that's really what, what this is about. And what they're saying is that b b based upon fuel, they can take a contract from, from fuel and be able to jumpstart the project. That's, that's, their, ol that's their overall goal. But I, I do wanna say this to the council. I think the council's made it known, the comments, what their preferences are. And so while the Greens Group would have the flexibility to look at fuel, I think that the Greens Group is wise enough to understand what the council has said here today. Thank you, Mr. Duffy. Mm -hmm. Council Member Hussey. Yes. One more quick comment for the residents. Um, like the mayor said, this is a concept, this is the beginning of the plans. And get involved. Get involved with planning commission meetings. Get involved with your voice. You know, I was part of the, the residents that helped with the high school and stuff, build that. So your voice matters. Uh, the Greens group, they said they'll work with the residents. So, you know, get involved. Tell about your concerns with the Reed Street. You know, ask if about 
the multifamilies if they could not put windows on one side. So that's up to you guys to get involved in the planning commission so it gets back to us. But, you know, let your voice be heard on that. But the mayor said that this concept, we're beginning stage of, uh, of the plan. So that's just all I had to say, Mayor. Thank you. All right. How would you like to move forward with this item then? Madam Mayor, I make a recommendation to approve the concept plans proposed by the Greens Group for development of 22317, 22293, and 22273 Barton Road, subject to in accordance with the executed agreement for the purchase and sale of real property and joint escrow instructions between the City of Grand Terrace and the Greens Group, or provide other directions regarding the pros concept plans and uh, direct City Manager to issue written approval notice of the selected concept plans to the Greens Group. Second. All right, so you're motioning for any of the three concepts? All three. Okay. And, okay, so motion by Council Member Allen, second by Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. Please vote. Motion passes with Council Members Allen and Hussey voting yes, Mayor Pro Tem Wilson voting yes, and Mayor McNabo voting yes. All right, thank you all for your discussion. Thank you to all of you who came out tonight. You know who the developers are. They promised to work with the, the neighbors, and I, I will take them at their word that they will do that. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item nine, which is award of contract for signal modification. Project at Preston Street and Barton Road in an amount not to exceed $82,000. Um, Mr. City Attorney, I believe we looked at this particular project once before and I am beyond 500 feet. Shall I stay or shall I go? Um, I, I I think we, we determined you could stay, All right. if I recall. Okay. Yep. For the record, I live on Preston Street, just beyond 500 feet from this particular project. Yes. All right. So we have before us Public Works Director Alan French. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening, uh, Council Members. I'm here to present this item of the contract for the signal modification for Preston and Barton Road. This item supports staff I'm sorry, the staff item supports goal, the 2030 goal number two, to maintain public safety by investing in critical improvements to the infrastructure, and it's on the department's priority project list. <clears throat> this project is to upgrade the traffic signal at Preston and Barton with a five-head left turn signal indicator that will be added to increase the safety for the turning movements um, in the slide, it, that's a, a replica of a five-head uh, indicator. Um, this will be installed at uh, on Barton Road section for the left turn onto Preston. The project also replaces the controller uh, that was damaged earlier this year uh, with a, in an accident that happened at the intersection. Uh, funding for the project uh, will come from the Spring Mountain Ranch mitigation uh, fund balance and also uh, the reimbursement that we received from the accident uh, to replace the controller cabinet on Preston. Uh, the traffic study for the Spring Mountain Ranch project determined that about 5% of traffic would be going through that intersection. So we would utilize up to uh, approximately 5% of the fund balance from that mitigation to pay for the project, as well as the um, reimbursement that we received from the uh, traffic accident. The project, uh, and you can see there's a slide of the accident, and then um, in the lower right-hand corner is the existing signal at Preston, and you can see there is no left turn indicators uh, on the signal today. Um, the project was uh, reviewed and supported by two traffic consultants that reviewed the site and both recommended to upgrade uh, this upgrade for the signal and that it would be the best solution at this time. Uh, as concluding, um, staff is recommending the council authorize the city manager to execute the agreement with TSR for 82000 for the signal modification at Preston and Barton. Should the council have any questions at this time, I'm here to amp and happy to answer any questions. 
and um, Gabriel Zapiritan from TSR is also here. Thank you. Thank you, Director French. Questions of staff at this time? Councilmember Allen. Thank you, Director French, uh, for your report. Is that a dedicated light turn lane in both, on front barn in both directions on Preston? Yes, Councilman, it sure is a dedicated Thank you. Lane. Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. Mr. French, is this going to be the solution to the long-term difficulty that everybody's experienced with the timing on this lovely stop, too? Um, um, Councilman, the, there was a timing issue after the accident for a, a long period of time where it was on timed phase phasing, mm -hmm. where it only went a certain time and then it would change. That has since been changed to the indicator, right. so that uh, that should have corrected the issue. Good. And, and this wouldn't affect that. Okay. Director French, there was a timing issue before the accident. Mm. I, I don't believe that anybody ever looked at that intersection. I believe that led to a lot of people running that intersection light, even if it was red, especially people coming from both sides of Preston because they felt that they had a very long time to wait when there was no traffic coming on Barton Road. I'm also hoping there's an opportunity for you to, to make sure that this is looked at periodically for timing issues, and that if there is a left turn, that certain times of the day it doesn't engage so that people are able to make a left turn without having to have the arrow, or not have to wait for it when there isn't anybody that that needs to turn. Okay, uh, yes, uh, Mayor. Are you able to do that? Uh, y yes, Madam Mayor. The, these, the five point signal head. Uh, okay, so can you tell me about the cost of this though? Why is it, okay. it $82,000? Okay, the um, signal modification for the left turn um, in, in addition to the controller cabinet, uh, all combined is the, uh, is the cost of the 82,000. So there's two components to the project um, and it, it involves, there's rewiring in the signal that's needed for the left turn, um, especially because the, it isn't there now. So that's a major part of the cost to get the, the wiring in and the controller cabinet uh, to be installed with the equipment inside the cabinet as well. It's not just the cabinet itself. Okay, thank you. Further questions? All right, are there requests to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. All right, close public comment, bring it back to council for consideration of a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we award a construction contract to TSR Construction and Inspection for Traffic Signal modification project to Preston Street and Barton Road in an amount not to exceed 82 grand and appropriate funding for project from Spring Mountain Ranch Fund and insurance settlement is listed below and authorize the city manager to execute the contract subject to city attorney approval as to form. Second. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem Wilson, uh, second by Council Member Hussey. Please vote. Motion passes with council members Allen and Hussey voting yes, Mayor Pro Tem Wilson voting yes, and Mayor McNabo voting yes. All right, item 10 is a discussion and direction regarding regulation of 24 hour uses, operations of businesses in Grand Terrace. Director Sandra Molina. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. It's indicated by the Mayor this is a discussion item. This item is consistent with our 2030 vision statement. Um, I'll go ahead and move forward with the rest of the presentation. So to give some background, um, city staff took a discussion to our city, excuse me, to our planning commission back on September 5th. Um, and the reason why we, to discuss 24-hour uh, operations and whether uses, uh, particularly um, entertainment type uses, restaurants, um, bars and, and those type of uses, whether if they're proposed to be 24 hours, whether they should be subject to administrative conditional use permit, or excuse me, a conditional use permit or some other permit or not regulated at all with regard to their operating hours. Um, this came about because um, staff does have a has request for 24 hour uses 
One is in um, a proposed new business. It's a, like a cafe tea house. Uh, the business owner that's proposing that is, is also the owner of Kaz Raman. Kaz Raman recently went to 24 hours. Um, <clears throat> and so we found that our zoning code and specific plan, Barton Road specific plan, are silent on 24 hour uses. Now the base use, the restaurant use, um, those are addressed and those are, are permissible, but um, operational aspects aren't really addressed. And the type of operational aspects that can sometimes come about on a 24 hour use might be noise or litter or lighting or security needs. And so um, because of those aspects of the operation of 24 hour uses, we did take the discussion to planning commission. And we asked the planning commission to look at or consider uh, the three items up on the slide here. One is to, to first, of course, to consider the, the item, but to uh, either recommend that 24-hour uses, such as restaurants, bars, fast food, uh, other entertainment uses, are subject to a conditional use permit and then direct staff for that recommendation to the city council. Um, they could also find that or recommend that 24-hour uses don't require a conditional use permit, and we would again direct that to council. And then ultimately, the the other option was for the planning commission to say, you know, this is a big, broad policy issue, um, direct to the council first. The, the planning commission, in having this discussion and taking um, public comment, so this slide's not working. Um, they um, had the residents express concern about 24-hour uses with regard to littering and possibly uh, you know, traffic, but also the business owner of Kaz Raman, Mr. Cormita, he also spoke about um, having 24-hour use and in, in, in the customer that he has. A lot of these customers come from maybe Loma Linda, um, the medical use, and so they're looking for a place to go during those um, non-traditional operating hours. And then also, a lot of his business, his patrons are const construction folks that are working on uh, are nearby freeways and they're doing, you know, 24 hours or that uh, graveyard shift, so to speak. And so they also um, uh, are a big component of his business. And so um, the commission also considered that discussion. Ultimately, what the planning commission did was recommend that 24-hour um, uses should be subject to a conditional use permit. And I apologize, that's hard to read, but the commission was very cognizant of the cost of a standard conditional use permit, and they recommended an administrative one. And so today we're, we're bringing to the council uh, commission's recommendation, but the city council also, again, as part of this discussion, can, um, in their consideration, determine that the CEP is not appropriate for 24-hour uses, um, or they can agree with the planning commission and direct the staff to make the necessary changes. What's in the staff report for the city council was um, subsequent to the planning commission's discussion, there was a, uh, another option that was proposed and that is a business permit requirement for 24 hour uses. And so that does not become a zoning um, application but it's more use application. And our municipal code does have business permits for uh, certain type of uses, um, such as for billiards, and that was an example that was put in the staff report. Um, later this evening, the council is going to consider a, a, a secondhand dealer permit or junk, junk dealer permit. That's under Title V, that's a business permit as well. So that's also an option for the council to consider in lieu of a conditional use permit. And in this, uh, I this is in the staff report, but this is just the table. Uh, the, the biggest difference between the two is, again, one's, one's based on zoning, one isn't. The review authority for a CUP is the planning commission. For business permit, that comes to city council. It's not, not part of the commission's purview. Um, and they're very similar in that, that those permits can be reviewed um, when it's determined that perhaps they're not operating in conformance with those permits. Um, and they can both be subject, well the CUP is subject to revocation if it gets to that point. A business permit can also be written that way, subject to revocation. And then after that, um, should the business continue to operate, then that would be a, a code case. And so, although these are, these are very similar, um, one is a land use type of permit and the other one is not. And so, um, with that, we would ask that the city council 
discuss this item, whether 24-hour uses should be regulated um, and consider these different alternatives or others and direct us accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Director Molina. Are there questions of staff at this time? Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. Director Molina, could you uh, describe for us how an administrative conditional use permit process would work? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. So the, the uh, administrative conditional use permit is a provision in our zoning code that if a business is going to occupy a space that's 2,000 square feet or less, then it qualifies for administrative conditional use permit. If the business occupies a site that's greater than 2,000 square feet or 2,000 and greater, then it's the standard conditional use permit. Um, most of the businesses that we see are occupying spaces less than 2,000 square feet. Um, the, the other difference is that um, administrative, it's reviewed at staff level and standard goes to planning commission at a notice public hearing and so the cost is different. Uh, standard conditional use permit subject to hearing is a $2,400 application, whereas a administrative CUP is a $620 application. Do you think it would be possible for us to, or would you recommend in this instance for a 24-hour use to be added to the 2,000 square foot ceiling on the uh, administrative uh, CUP and see that that would work in place of a full-on CUP. I apologize, um, Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. I didn't understand the first half of that question. At this point, the way you explained it, the ceiling on a, an administrative CUP is <clears throat> up to 2,000 square feet of livable or usable. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, because 24-hour uh, use is, a, is kind of a gray area, um, would it be possible for us to amend or would it be desirable for us to amend our uh, administrative CUP process to include 24-hour uses? I see. Because this is not a, a zoning issue per se, but more of an operational issue than to amend our code to say a 24-hour use is an administrative CUP, we, we could, if that's the desire of the council, amend our CU, or excuse me, our, our code. And I'll... I'll let the city attorney also chime in on that. Thank you. Mr. City Attorney. <laughs> Nothing to chime in at this point. <laughs> you did a good job, Director Molina. Thank you. Councilmember Allen. Well, I was, as I was reading and studying about this, um, and then in my discussions, you know, and learning more about it, um, the, it seems like since this is uh, not a land use issue, which is what, the CUPs are for, perhaps the business permit might be the right way to go with it, or a more, either maybe less complicated, I don't know if, it, if I can say less complicated, but it, I think it would provide the control that we're looking for. I have a question before you answer that. Because you can, you, can, you can answer that as part of this answer. When we have a gas station come into town is there a different kind of requirement with their business permit than there is with other businesses that come in? With regard to the 24-hour aspect, again, our, our codes don't address the operational aspect of a gas station or another use being 24 hours. Um, gas stations fall back under the base zoning. Okay. But, but our gas stations are 24 hours. We do. Our, our gas stations here in town currently are 24 hours. And so we, do we ask them when they come in, these gas stations? I know they've been there for a while. Do we ask if they're going to operate 24 hours? Because there are places where gas stations do not operate 24 hours. Um, you, you are correct, Mayor, that, that these stations do predate, um, but we don't. We wouldn't. We may ask, for instance, we've asked our fast food uses whether they operate 24 hours. For us, the, um, the, the difference between a, a gas station is typically they, because they're 24 hours if they are, they're already addressing those security concerns. Because gas stations, you have a lot of drive-through traffic, so they're addressing the security concerns. Um, they have lighting already in place. They're taking care of um, those type of issues where perhaps a, a restaurant or a bar or something like that 
they may have security issues, but they may not be addressing them unless they're, as part of the CUP or business permit, asked to address them. So that, that would be a, one difference. Well, that is, a, that, that is a specific concern, Mayor, what she was just mentioning is, because I know that at, down at uh, Kazraman at the parking lot at night, it's, it's not lit, but he's open. And, and that has been mentioned uh, to me personally about that. So uh, lighting and security and that sort of thing with 24-hour businesses, when the business owner is not the property owner, you know, and trying to, you know, make sure that how is, is, is that going to be addressed? And I also would like to know how much a business permit costs as opposed to the, I know the admin CUP 620 or 640, I think, no, 620. <laughs> A business permit based on the, is it, does the cost vary on those? So, um, I'll, let me answer that, Council Member Allen, in response to your other question as well. So, um, from, a, from a staff perspective to, from, from a, how we implement the, the Council's desire, for instance, if the Council says it should be an administrative conditional use permit, then that's a very simple amendment to our code. If the council directs staff to uh, establish a business permit process, then that's a different change. We, we still, both times we, we do amend our code, but we have to create the standards for the business permit for a 24 hour use. We don't have any right now. So we would, so the level of effort, the effort of work is a little bit more, but we're happy to do whatever the council desires. Thank you. I'm sorry, and let me just follow up. And there's no fee established just yet for a business permit. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Duffy, you had a comment? Yes, Mayor, just a point of clarification that I think the council should probably, uh, the city attorney should probably weigh in here. As we talk about the 24 hour um, use, I, I think through my conversation with the city attorney, he, he referenced that you would be establishing when, when businesses can can open and operate within the city, open and close. Because if you say 24 hour regulations, if someone opens 23, 20, 24, I mean 2022, 20, uh, that's, that's not really the issue here. The issue is, uh, and I think that the, from my conversation with the city attorney is that, that how do you enforce a 24 hour operation? I think that should be a part of your your discussion to see how that's how that how that plays out. What measures would the count if the council approves this? What measures would they put in place to to regulate the 24-hour businesses? And that is, how do you stop them from operating 24 hours by establishing a time of cutoff when businesses can operate in the city? Council Member Allen. I just want to make sure I understand that. So rather than saying, than stipulating 24 hour business, we would have to stipulate a, a time that a business, like, a, like midnight, 2 a.m., is that what you're saying? I want the city attorney, oh, wait. Mr. City Attorney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, to be clear, I, mean, I think the first question is, do we want our businesses to operate 24 hours? That's a yes or no. Uh, proposition. From there, uh, staff and I will work on the language to address whatever the policy direction is. Uh, like currently, uh, does a gas station require a CUP? I'm, I'm not sure about that. It might be triggered with the convenience store. Okay. Let's assume hypothetically that we have a business that will require a CUP to operate. One of the conditions of approval in our code existing is limits on hours of operation or duration of approval. So we already have, and this goes back to your question, can we ask and, and do we ask? And so I would suggest that if we do, if it is subject to a CUP already, we would ask that question. Um, and if, if the council's policy direction was to say we do not want 24 hours or we want operations to cease at 2, 2 a.m. And, and 6 a.m. in that period, that that would be, um, incorporated into the code so that's more clear. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Further questions? All right, we'll open it up to public comment. Are there any requests to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. All right, we'll bring it back to Council for Deliberation and Direction. Madam Mayor. Council Member Allen. You know, I don't wanna, I'm pretty hesitant to try to restrict any business on their efforts to make, make money. 
like, you know. A the, as am I. <laughs> you know, and for obvious reasons, but um, I also understand that the concerns that residents and surrounding uh, area might have. Um, I just. I would like to find a way that we can mitigate our concerns of noise and litter and security in the least intrusive and least expensive way possible for our businesses. Has, has, this, has this become an issue with our residents? Is this why it's on the agenda? Is this, is some, has there been a, some concerns expressed? The, Director Molina. Been, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we, we've had a lot of, we've had of recent uses that are proposing 24 hours, and it's just an area that's not really addressed in our zoning. For instance, um, th there is an application for a Taco Bell currently in, uh, being processed. When they first came in, they wanted to be um, not 24 hours, but operate to like five in the morning, which is not 24 hours, and I think this speaks to maybe the attorney's comment. That's not 24 hours, but there's, there's those impacts of noise and potentially litter um, and that land use interface. And so they've since then modified those hours so they're, they're not proposing to operate that late. Um, but then we also have Cosrama that's 24 hours and a second business that will be proposing to be 24 hours in that same center. So we brought the question forward. Thank you, Director Molina. Uh, City Manager would like to make a comment. Yeah, and just to, to, just to comment, uh, dovetail on that. The reason why this became an issue is because during our normal development process, when a new business comes in and during construction, they disclose all of those things. They, they ask for operating hours. We look at noise. We look at all issues. We, we make sure that the lighting's correct and so on and so on. It is the case where you have an existing building where you have someone going in like Kaz Rahman who, who can modify the hours without there being that, that, that regulation. And so that, so it's the cause Rama, and it's it's a thought process of the, of the of the new uh, cause ramen too. They're 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 trying to open their little finger food coffee shop, and so that's where we don't have any regulation. Whereas Taco Bell, uh, McDonald's, Miguel's, all of those items, you know, um, noise, traffic, uh, lighting, all of those items were addressed initially when those businesses started. So when you have someone going into, a, you know, into an existing building, that's where the, the gap is, that we don't have someone to say, hey, well, wait a minute. You just gotta get a business license and you determine your own hours. And so that's, a, there haven't been, I guess we should probably get the Lieutenant Wolf to weigh in. I don't know of any issues associated with Kaz Ramen having noise complaints um, I know one of the things when they when they wanted to do their when we were told they were doing their two their two a.m. in the morning operations, our initial concern was hey lighting, mm -hmm. security, and so I think we we addressed those issues mm -hmm. in, in when they came in for for the original purpose because yeah, they were doing I guess tenant improvements and that's when we mm -hmm. we caught them in the process. Thank you, mm -hmm. Councilmember Allen. Um, I know we keep referencing Kaz Ramen in this discussion, but we have other businesses we've talked about that are open 24 hours. And if we want to talk with, uh, have are there concerns? The, the, are those same concerns would uh, could be be addressed by Lieutenant uh, uh, Wolf? Uh, I mean, do, do those businesses have those same concerns that we have with Kaz Ramen? I mean, lighting and security are there? They actually have theirs under control. Well, I think your 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 current co your current code tries to regulate that because you have some requirements for billiard rooms and things of that particular nature. So you, you so you've got that in there. But this was a, this is a unique area that we're um, we're approaching, and I, I I think we I think what staff is trying to do is is to be proactive versus having to be reactive later on. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I would, uh, I would support an administrative conditional use permit process for a 24 hour use. Well, 
Well, would it, Council Member Allen. Would the uh, would that provide the amount of control that, that you want to have over, or what kind of control do you want to have, and would that provide it? Uh, I, I think it provides it. I just the cost of it is is what I'm concerned about, Mr. Duffy. Well, I, I think we we would need a little more clarity to make sure what we need to include as a part of that process. Because right now you have gas stations that you said are operating 24 hours. So if we if we approve an administrative CUP, would we then be asking those gas stations to now try to get a CUP? Or are we limiting the focus? Uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I think it would only be fair to grandfather those uses in. Madam Mayor, if I may. Mr. City Attorney. Uh, thank you. Um, th that is certainly one option. Another option that I, I have uh, implemented is to give existing operations a grace period of like two years, a year, whatever the council uh, directs to come into compliance by obtaining the permit. Uh, so it's not immediate, uh, but it does give them time to, uh, to bring their operations to current code. And so would we look back at the gas station use and see if they already have a CUP that addresses the issue and then it wouldn't be required? Possibly, yes. I mean, I leave that to the director. Madam Mayor, we, we could do that. Just as long as we have some kind of paper coverage, I suppose, in relation to that use, uh, those gas stations have been there for a long time. I, I just, I'm reluctant to impose additional requirements and processing on, on a business that's already here and thriving uh, when we're the ones that didn't have an ordinance that actually addressed the issue. Mr. Duffy, <laughs> would you like to share your comments? Well, yes, Mayor. I was just I was asking this, the city attorney, w would it be uh, acceptable if, as part of the council's recommendation, uh, that, that they would say that that you would require a, an administrative CUP for for any business that doesn't have an existing business license in the city? That doesn't have an existing business license. Right. So if a new business came in and wanted to operate 24 hours, they would be subject to the administrative CUP. Mr. City Attorney. I, I, same concept. I don't know if I, I tie it to the business license. I just say basically any, any business existing as of the date of the ordinance uh, effective date shall be grandfathered in or however you want to say it, right. if that's the direction of the council. Any business that's currently operating 24 hours. That's correct. Okay. And how will you measure that? 24 hours? We'll have to determine that, <laughs> yes. All right. All right, so do you have direction? Do you need to come back to us with this? Uh, I, I would recommend a, a motion uh, so it's clear for the record as to what the direction is to the staff. All right. Mayor Pro Tem. See how we word this, uh, word this. Um, I'd like to make a motion that uh, uh, the city attorney draft uh, language uh, to enable a administrative conditional use permit uh, process uh, with regard to the 24-hour uses and operations in Grand Terrace and a, a caveat that uh, addresses the issue of, of uh, prior use uh, and what process might be uh, pursued, uh, not including a complete uh, new process. Second. Okay. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. Very well stated. Second by Council Member Hussey. Please vote. 
Motion passes with Council Members Allen and Hesse voting yes, Mayor Pro Tem Wilson voting yes, and Mayor Macnabo voting yes. All right, thank you. We'll move to item 11, which is an application of Safeway Recycling and Recovering, Inc. for City Council approval of a junk and secondhand dealer license for the property located at 21516 Main Street. Director of Planning and Development Services, Sandra Molina. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. So <clears throat> this proposal is for um, a junk and secondhand dealer license for Safeway Recycling. So at 21516 Main Street, uh, there used to be a business there called American Metal Recycling. And uh, in 2011, they received a conditional use permit to be able to um, collect uh, recyclable materials, CRV, you know, cans and plastic bottles. Um, they also took in metal products and some household items such as uh, bed frame. Well, yeah, the uh, the metal bed frames they would take in um, refrigerators. But um, our business uh, permit requirements for any uh, business that takes in scrap metals, because they also took in uh, scrap metals, they require this business permit. And so uh, American Metal Recycling recently vacated the premises and Safeway um, Recycling and Recovery is proposing to occupy that space. And so part of that process, um, they're able to reoccupy that space operating in the same manner as American Metal Recycling under that conditional use permit, but they are required to get their own business permit through the city council. Um, and chapter 5.44 regulates this type of permit. This uh, application was forwarded to our building and safety department, the sheriff's department, um, and the planning department reviewed it to uh, get recommendations and all three departments are recommending that the council issue this business permit. Um, in addition, um, this type of use is heavily regulated, our municipal code and um, our business and California Business and Professions Code highly regulates this type of business. And so the business takes in a, somebody comes in to recycle metal, they have to have an ID, they have to get all their information, they have to put that in the records, they have to notate what the item was, and they need to keep those records on site and they're uh, subject to inspection um, with notice. And so um, with that, staff is recommending that the city council issue the, or approve the business permit, but staff does have one proposed modification to the resolution, and on stamp page 397, down at section two with the council's findings, we would add at the end, so it would read, uh, the city council hereby approves a junk and secondhand dealer's license for Safeway Recycling and Recovery, Inc., subject to the requirements contained in chapter 5.44, junk and secondhand dealers of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code and all other applicable laws, applicable laws, comma, and contingent upon issuance of a business license so that they run together. And with that, um, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Molina. Turn the comm back over to the mayor. Questions of staff at this time? Councilmember Allen. <clears throat> Thank you, Director Molina. Um, packet page 391, in the last paragraph about halfway down, it's, or partway down, it says that, um, well, the whole paragraph says, in approving the use, the Planning Commission imposed several conditions of approval, and it goes through some of those, and then one of those conditions is prohibiting on-site disassembly. Is that, that's disassembly of, junk that's brought there is that is that correct uh, yes when the um, planning commission was considering the cup in 2011 they yeah. were they were concerned that people were going to drive in a vehicle or bring something in and dismantle exactly what you're saying yes okay because they do that there i've used that that place for many years to turn in my recycling and people go there and they dismantle all kinds of things in that parking lot and so i just i think that you know we need to make sure that if yes. we're in this Further questions? All right, we'll open it up to public comment. Are there any requests to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. All right, close public comment, and bring it back to council for consideration of a motion. Ms. 
So we're, this is for a bus, uh, business license, right? Is that correct, Ms. Director Molina? Um, the, the, it's a business permit. Business permit. Yeah. Okay, Madam Mayor. Then um, I recommend that we adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Grand Terrace approving a junk and secondhand dealer's license for Safeway Recycling and Recovery. Second. Motion by Councilmember Allen, second by Mayor Pro Tem Wilson. Please vote. Motion passes with Council Members Allen and Hussey voting yes, Mayor Pro Tem Wilson voting yes, and Mayor McNabo voting yes. Thank you. So we'll move on to item 12, which is professional services agreement between the City of Grand Terrace and Inner West Consulting Group to provide management services to planning and development services and public works department in the amount not to exceed $147,000. Director Molina. Yes, Madam Mayor, thank you, members of the City Council. As indicated by the Mayor, this is a proposal to enter into a contract, a new contract with uh, InterWest Consulting Group for management services to planning and, and public works. So in 2017, the, the City Council did approve um, an amendment to an existing contract with InterWest. So the existing contract was for, um, or is for public works inspection and construction management. And so we took to the city council, the city council approved a modification to incorporate um, deputy building official and plans examiner um, functions. And the contract limited the services to 16 hours per week. Um, the plan checking component of the um, service would be offset by developer deposits. And so there was an offset with re regard to the hourly rate. So we've, we've been um, operating under that contract since 2017. Um, and I would add that the city had budgeted a deputy building, excuse me, a building official, but because we were having difficulty um, hiring a person that would work part time, um, we ended up going to consulting services. But since then, um, we're finding that um, we have a greater need in um, planning and in public works for a, a consultant that would provide management level um, services to the directors and also to our line frontline staff. Um, there's a bit of, um, there was a need for that middle, middle manager type of, of, of consulting services. And so this new contract would expand the scope of services to um, provide that level of service, not only to, to planning and development services, but also to public works. And so the expanded scope would include, um, again, management services support to those different departments and divisions. Um, the um, person would also provide direct customer service at the counter in the field. Um, and I would also, as indicated in the staff report, we've, um, under the auspices of the contract, we have brought in a consultant named Chaz Ferguson, whose resume is in the staff report. And he's been providing this 40-hour uh, service and he's been going out to the field. He's been helping people at the counter. He's been um, helping with uh, code enforcement staff and animal control staff, and also with some um, public works issues that have come um, have come up. And so, um, part of the work would be again the building official, the plans examiner, also some inspections that he's gone out and done. Um, and then there would be um, the hourly offset again by the developer deposits. So staff would recommend that uh, the city council award the agreement to InterWest to provide the management services to planning, development services, and public works not to exceed $147,000 and authorize the mayor to execute the agreement subject to city attorney approval as to form with, with regard to the contract. Thank you, Director Molina. Are there questions of staff at this time? Council Member Allen. <clears throat> Director Molina on packet page 417 under additional services. Um, there's a sentence partway down that says any increase in compensation of up to 10% of the contract sum or $25,000, whichever is less, or in the time to perform of up to 180 days may be approved by the contract officer $25,000, that's 20% of the contract, isn't it? About 20% of the, is that the correct amount? 
and and the the and the contracting officer can approve that. The, um, this this particular section is written so in addition to that contract amount not to exceed, but. Um, was the city attorney going to comment on this particular section? Mr. City Attorney? Sure. What this section does is just provide some flexibility if some special project comes up that the contract officer can approve something. In this case, it's, uh, it's up to 10% no, of the contract value or 25,000, whichever is less. In this case, the contract value is 147,000. 10% oh, okay. of that is 14,700. So that would be the contract officer's cap. Uh, should additional services be required, or or twenty five thousand, but uh, that's irrelevant. That's so irrelevant that's, because uh, it's saying whichever is less. And the contracting officer would be the city manager at this time. Uh, I believe so. Yes. Further questions? All right. We'll open up public comment. Any request to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. All right. We'll bring it back to council for consideration of a motion. Uh, Mayor, I'll, I'll make a motion that we recommend, I recommend uh, award a professional service agreement to InterWest Consulting Group to provide management services to the Planning Development Services and Public Works Department in an amount not to exceed $147,000 and authorize the mayor to execute the agreement subject to city attorney approval as to form. Second. Motion by Councilmember Allen, second by Councilmember Hussey. Please vote. Motion passes with Councilmembers Allen and Hussey voting yes, Mayor Pro Tem Wilson voting yes, and Mayor McNabo voting yes. All right, thank you. So our request for future agenda items will be moved to another date. City Manager Communications. Thank you, Mayor. Just wanted to remind the mayor and council and the community about the trunk retreat event that's going to be occurring next Thursday, October 31st, from 6 to 9 p.m. There'll be costume contests uh, and there'll be costume judging from uh, ages 0 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, and 16 plus, as well as dog costume judging. And it's a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun last year, and it's a great way for uh, the community to come out and, and have a good time for. Uh, Trick or treat, trunk or treat. All right. Also, we have the the annual country fair coming up on November the Saturday, November the second. So it's going to be a fun-filled weekend starting on Thursday and on Saturday, culminating with the the, the uh, country fair put on by the Historical Cultural Committee. It's from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at City Hall. We look forward to seeing everybody there. Also, then on November the 11th, we have our annual uh, Veterans Day at Veterans Freedom Park event. On November the 11th, uh, we, we encourage everyone to come out at, at the Veterans Freedom Park. And then finally, Mayor, my uh, final presentation is uh, you're going to help me out with, I'm not very happy about this, but I do wish uh, Sandra Molina a really great uh, uh, Warm wishes and good luck in her, her new endeavor. She'll be leaving us. Um, this is her la last week of employment with us, and she'll be going to Cathedral City to um, do some of the great things she's done here. And so we have a plaque, and we'd like the mayor and the council to, to uh, read the plaque, and then we're going to take a photo of the Grand Terrace family so we can treasure that as we miss Ms. Molina. This is presented to Sandra Molina, Planning and Development Services Director, for your sincere commitment and devotion, in grateful appreciation for your years of outstanding service and dedication, for your leadership and hard work, your attention to detail, and exemplary, exemplary work ethic has aided the city to a level that has prospered. For your unselfish commitment and tireless cooperation, City of Grand Terrace thanks you for all your contributions towards enhancing the quality of life of the residents of this community dated the 22nd of October, 2019. And I echo the city manager when I say I'm not happy about this, but <laughs> I do wish you the best. And I know that, that the city of, that you will be working in is very lucky to have you.
With that, Mayor, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Duffy. All right, we, w we do have a closed session tonight, so we will be recessing the closed session. And for those of you that are watching, we'll let you know that our next regular city council meeting will be held on Tuesday, November 12, 2019, at 6 p.m. Any request to have an item placed on future agenda must be made in writing and submitted to the city clerk's office. The request will be processed in accordance with council procedures. Thank you to everybody who came out and spoke tonight and shared their opinions and concerns with us. And at this time, we will recess to close session, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9B, one potential case. At this time, we are in recess. I do. All right, we'll reconvene to open session. Council met in closed session, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9B, one potential case. No reportable actions at this time. Direction was given to staff. So with that, we will adjourn to our next regular city council meeting to be held on Tuesday, November 12th. 2019 at 6 p.m. Any request to have an item placed on future agenda must be made in writing and submitted to the city clerk's office, and the request will be processed in accordance with council procedures. We are adjourned.